Sonic the Hedgehog has been with a lot of us since we were little kids. But in all those years, have you ever stopped to ask why Sonic gotta go fast? I posit that he's been constantly running away from various debacles and embarrassments. He was body shamed on Twitter so mercilessly, they spent $35 million redesigning his sexy legs and horrifying mouthful of human teeth. He once lost his single, gigantic eyeball at the Macy's Parade. His own fans can't seem to stop impregnating him in all manner of curse and crossover. But that's exactly what we're here for. The bonkers, the embarrassing, the unbelievable bits of canon that Sega would like to slowly drown us for divulging. We're talking Sonic's canonical kinks, his stint as a petty narc, and the fact that, yeah, he's hooking up with all those little critters. This is Cannonball. Man, it's crazy what some people will do to an innocent children's character. Poor Sega, right? No, not poor Sega. Sega made a deal with the devil when they set out to create a cynical corporate chimera, and the entire canon has been in shambles ever since. Let me explain. Number five. Sonic doesn't just inspire bizarre fanfiction, he is fanfiction. Back in the late 80s, Sega bigwigs realized they needed a hot new character to rival Mario's innate ability. And their original mascot, this sexless little turd named Alex Kidd, just wasn't cutting it. Instead of coming up with a novel concept for a new character, Sega basically said, what if we took every character that's currently popular and smashed them into one impossibly rad dude? And I'm barely exaggerating here. An early iteration was a simple equation. Bart Simpson plus Super Mario equals profit? From there, someone decided that actually he should be a rabbit, but that rabbit needed attitude. The only currency that mattered in a pre-9-11 world. Attitude and prehensile ears. But 1990 video game technology wasn't advanced enough to accommodate that many gripping appendages, so they dialed him back to a decidedly less rad armadillo. And then corporate infighting took the wheel. Sega of Japan turned him into a hedgehog with fangs named Mr. Needlemouse. Sega of America pushed back on that design, which they disparagingly called yikes to Japanese. They tried to fix Sonic by making him way more American. His fancy shoes were inspired by Michael Jackson. The color of his shoes was inspired by Santa Claus, and his can-do attitude was inspired by none other than Bill Clinton. Seriously, that's a holy trinity of 90s heroes who turned out to be real pieces of shit. The dumbest part of this gross corporate pandering slash cultural cleansing was that it actually worked. According to one nationwide survey, Sonic the Hedgehog was, at one point, as recognizable to the American public as Mickey Mouse. And hey, did you know this cynical Frankenstein's monster of every bad boy of the 80s and 90s absolutely f Number four, Sonic's weird sexual energy is completely intentional. There's one more element to Sonic's bizarre creation story that I neglected to mention, but I think you're old enough now to learn the truth. In one of his earliest designs, Sega made sure to give Sonic a very human, very adult girlfriend, a busty, lusty, pixie-cutted uber Barbie named Madonna. And if you thought a 15-year-old hedgehog hooking up with an adult woman three times his size is gross, which it is, just wait until you hear about his other girlfriends. He'd go on to acquire an entire petting zoo's worth of animal lovers, which might appear somewhat more appropriate until you consider the power dynamics at play. From the start, Sonic's whole thing is that he saves these helpless animals from bondage. These little guys all have names. There's Flicky, Ricky, Pocky, Rocky, Pecky, Picky, and Cucky. But they're clearly much younger and or much less sentient than Sonic. That becomes kind of disturbing when they started giving Sonic romantic interests in his long-running Archie comic series. He's ostensibly dating the very animals he once saved. Oh, did I say ostensibly? I meant literally. Ricky was renamed Sally Acorn, who had a whole series of romantic storylines with Sonic. At one point, she breaks up with him because he's obsessed with Dr. Robotnik. You know, the evil mastermind behind the mass kidnappings of her and her family? Could it be that she got sick of Sonic grooming young animals for future romantic arcs? Then there's Pocky, who was renamed Bunny Rabbit, and became one of Sonic's freedom fighters. She was usually depicted as something of a sister to him, but he's still swooped in after a bad breakup and smooched her in the bushes. Not an innuendo. Sonic managed to ruin an even closer friendship with his wandering eye. He repeatedly cock-blocked Tails' presumably twin dongs so that he himself could have a fling with Fiona Fox. Oh, and 
she was secretly screwing around with evil Sonic at the same time. Does this all sound like it was written by a room full of middle schoolers who just found out what second base is? Well, it gets worse. In a 2006 video game, Sega got back to what it does best, bestiality, intellectual property theft, and they added a little bit of necrophilia for good measure. In this game, Sonic gets fully murdered and is lying dead on the ground when the very human Princess Elise decides to give him a little non-consensual open-mouthed snog. It revives our boy, but in the form of Super Sonic, a clear ripoff of Dragon Ball Z's Super Saiyan form. So at best, it can be said that Sonic's moral compass is unreliable. Surely no one would give him unfettered access to the hearts and minds of our country's youth. Number three, Sonic was a big time narc and he wanted your kids to be too. There were no fewer than three separate Sonic the Hedgehog animated series in the 90s, and they all had three very strange things in common. Sonic loved to eat chili dogs. He kept trying to make this weird new catchphrase work. Let's juice. And he was voiced by America's coolest pop culture icon, Steve Urkel. You gotta Google me deep to, 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 to know that I did Sonic. These days we hand out roles like Spider-Man and Batman like friggin' candy. So it's kinda nice that back in the 90s, one franchise was bold enough to give Jaleel White the task of voicing the same character in three wildly different universes. Let's start with the most recent one, 1999's Sonic Underground. You can think of Sonic here as kind of a hot topic Woody Guthrie. He was in a rock band made up of abandoned orphans whose instruments turned into badass future weapons, including this guitar that doubled as kind of a tactical fog machine? Anyway, the important thing is that they ended Robotnik's reign of terror through the power of rock and roll and one time reggae. No one is an island. That sounds pretty rad, except that these three were actually royalty themselves. So they weren't anti-fascist so much as they were anti someone else's brand of fascism. Help, help, I'm being repressed. The other two series aired simultaneously, but could not have been more different in tone and theme. Sonic the Hedgehog, which ran on Saturday mornings, was dark and gritty and focused on environmentalism in a technocentric dystopian future and the dangers of fascistic movements overthrowing a democratic government. Man, what does Sega have against fascism? Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, on the other hand, was a goofy romp around Mobius that featured bumbling bad guys with resting dumb face. While this does feature Sonic at his most rad, it also managed to turn him into a bootlicking snitch. Every episode ended with a PSA in which Sonic would promote things like loyalty to the state and other authority figures. He once convinced an innocent henchman to stay in an abusive relationship. And he was staunchly against all kinds of cool shit, like smoking, graffiti, and the right to repair. Never try to fix an electrical appliance on your own. Most unforgivable of all, we had to see his gag-inducing bare feet and his horrid human thumb. Sonic really lost his way for a while there. If only someone had sat down and written out the definitive version of Sonic's story. Number two, the Sonic Bible is all about Sonic's daddy issues and various other freaky little kinks. All this canonical confusion began before the first game ever hit the market. Back in 1991, Sega of America found itself in a unique predicament. They had to draw up marketing plans while the game was still being created in Japan. Whether out of spite or simply because they were swamped, the Japanese team didn't keep the Americans up to speed on the emerging backstory. So the Americans decided to build their own from scratch, and they called their holy tome the Sonic Bible. In 13 short pages, we learn Sonic was born in small town Nebraska in the distant future, the year 2000. The distant future. Ish. His father fell into a vat of toxic waste, gurgled to death, and his soul was trapped in a portrait that his mom kept on the mantle. Being a hedgehog, Sonic was illiterate and mute, so he curried favor with all the locals by tearing out his quills one by one and giving them to little kids and old ladies. Oh, and he became a high school track star before he turned one year old. So what about those daddy issues? While he was supposed to be hibernating, he snuck out to the lab of the kindly Dr. Kintobor, an environmentalist and inventor who somehow resembled his literal hedgehog father? Anywho, Sonic spent that winter trying to impress Kintobor, who loved Sonic so much, specifically loved to watch him exercise, that he built him this weird quantum treadmill thing that helped him run at the speed of light. When a rogue wave of radiation fused Kintobor with a half-eaten, hard-boiled egg, he turned into the evil Dr. Robotnik and dedicated his life to killing Sonic instead of teaching him computer science. Also, this is glossed over in both Bibles, Holy and Sonic, but merits a closer inspection. Sonic liked to play 
play a cute little prank where he'd go to a bowling alley, curl up and pretend to be a bowling ball, and let the townsfolk hurl him down the lanes. Anyone who's ever held a bowling ball is, at this moment, trying to figure out where the fingers go. I think deep down, you already know. Anyway, this weird anecdote wasn't for public consumption, but it did inform the very first piece of Sonic Media ever published, an English language promotional comic that Sega of Japan was furious about. That f***ed up story about a little Midwestern dirtball getting fingered and befriending a creepy bachelor was now canon. For a while, anyway. Sega was finally able to shake this story with 1998's Sonic Adventure, which made all of that crap officially fictional. After seven long years, they were able to wrest control of the cannon and put guardrails on the adventures of their cuddly buzzsaw. But only in the games. The comics remained a canonical battlefield for over 20 years. Number 1. Sonic and Friends are relentlessly smited by spiteful, fickle, pedantic nerd gods. Sonic's Archie comics were the longest running video game based comic series ever made. As you might imagine, it was hard to reconcile the relative simplicity of the video games with 24 years of war, softcore furry porn, and the occasional holocaust allegory. Naturally, they had to call a mulligan every once in a while. The baffling part is the disastrous ways they insisted on retconning the most arbitrary details. Take Charmy B, for example. In 2003's Sonic Heroes, Sega randomly changed his age from 16 to six. It fell to the comic book writers to explain why their unmistakably teenaged character suddenly had the brain of a child. And they went with traumatic brain injury. The 2007 issue, Cracking the Empire, had Eggman drain Charmy's brain, leaving him mentally handicapped, which they played for laughs. Amy Rose got a similar treatment. After 1998's Sonic Adventure established that she'd grown out of her childish tutu and into a much more adult red dress, the comic writers had to figure out how to make her speed run puberty. As in human physiology, Amy grew into a woman by wishing upon a ring of acorns. Then there's Knuckles' f***ed up family. After some former writers successfully sued Sega for the rights to their characters, the current writers were forced to euthanize the vast majority of Knuckles' sprawling, inbred family tree. So there you have it. Corporate greed and petty squabbling are responsible for Sonic the Hedgehog's highest highs and lowest lows. You know what? Let's just bring back Alex Kidd. Look at him, he's so innocent. That's what I like about him, he doesn't have any baggage. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Cannonball. Jump in the comments, let me know if there's any other cool Sonic lore I missed or any other weird animals he f***ed.